if what a tree or a branch does is lost on you, well, now, then, you are surely lost. What do you do when you're lost in the forest? Stand still. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. We live in a world lost in the forest. How do we find our way in the midst of it? That's a mighty fine question. So I was the CEO of a large religious nonprofit. I was the chair of a small television network. I was the editor at large of a national magazine. I was a successful, well-educated white American male. But Thomas Merton said it's a tough thing to climb to the top of the ladder of success only to, to realize when you get there that your ladder has been leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> so I knew from the time I was three or four years of age I was transgender. In my naivete, I thought I got to choose I think that also was white male entitlement. I thought a gender fairy would arrive and say, okay, what's it gonna be? But alas, no gender fairy arrived, so I just lived my life. I did not hate being a boy. I just knew I wasn't one. Went to college, got married, had kids, built a career. But the call toward authenticity has all the subtlety of a smoke alarm. And eventually decisions have to be made. And so I came out as transgender and promptly lost every single one of my jobs. I'd been director of the nonprofit ministry for 35 years. I had never had a bad review. And I lost that job within 24 hours. I lost every single job. In all 50 states of the United States, you cannot be fired for being transgender. But, 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 in all 50, you can be fired if you're transgender and you work for a religious corporation. Good to know. <laughs> so I lost my pension when I transitioned, which was worth about a million dollars. Eh, give, or, give or take a dollar or two. Plus, I had loaned my organization $500,000 because I'd made some good investments and I wanted us to use it as cash flow. So when I came out, they decided arbitrarily that was a gift, not a loan. I had to threaten a lawsuit to get 80% of that back. At least I got 80% of it back, which was a very good thing because over the next 48 months, I earned $23,000. Less than $6,000 a year for four years. Then things started changing. I did a TED Talk, and then I did another TED Talk, and another TED Talk, and those TED Talks have now had 9 million views. And I became a coach for TED, a speaker's ambassador for TED. I became an MC for TED programs. Simon & Schuster came to me and wanted me to do a book, which has sold quite well as a woman, what I learned about power, sex, and the patriarchy after I transitioned. I have a movie production company that has signed rights for my life. They have finished writing the first season of a three-season, 30-show arc about my existence. So things have worked out for me quite well, but I did not know that at the time. So I was speaking at the TED Summit in Edinburgh four years ago this week. And I said to the group there, a terrible thing is happening in the United States this year. 25 bills have been introduced in state legislatures to take away the rights of transgender people. 25 of them, that's awful, that's terrible. And most of the people there, most of them from Europe were like, yes, that's awful, that's terrible. Yeah, this year it's 565, 78 of them have been signed into law. What's happening? And everybody says, well, it's Republicans. Actually, it's not. Two studies have been done showing that 61% of Republicans believe transgender people should have the same civil rights as everybody else. 61% of Republicans, two different studies, one by the Pew Research one by Amerist in New York Times, or uh, NBC. 61% of Republicans believe that transgender people should have the same civil rights as everybody else. 
So if Republicans think we should have civil rights, correct me if I'm wrong, but all 78 of those laws are laws in states with Republican-controlled legislatures. So if it's not Republicans per se, who is it? Oh, you're a wild goose. You know the answer to this. It is evangelical Christians. 2019, 84% of evangelical Christians believe that gender was immutably determined at birth. 84%, 2019, we've made a lot of progress since then in getting the message out because today, 2023, it's 87%. Three points higher. 2019, 61% of evangelicals believe transgender people, that would be me, already have way too many civil rights. 61% now to 2023, it's 67%, six points higher, yay! Two thirds of evangelicals believe that I already have too many civil rights. Okay. 2019, only 25% of people knew, evangelicals knew someone who was out as a transgender person. Now that number is up to 31%. And still, we see this opposition to transgender rights. Why? What's going on? Well, I speak a lot on this at the corporate level and at the government level. I've done a lot of work with the Biden administration. And I'm willing to speak on this because, hey, I had a lot of decades of white male privilege. And I got to do something with that. I mean, I got to live a hell of a long time just to make up for the damage I did in the world. So I bring that entitlement with me. I will not live long enough to lose my white male entitlement. I understand that. But I may as well then use it for something. And so I speak all over the United States and Europe. Europe's interesting. Generally speaking, I speak on gender equity issues. I do that for a half an hour. They pay me a lot of money. Then I do another half hour of Q&A. In the last 18 months, major corporations, so like think CBS, Viacom, um, Pinterest, MasterCard, IBM, um, Procter & Gamble, I come to the half hour Q&A. Do you know how many of those Q&A sessions did not include a question on what the hell is happening with religion in America? None. Because I'm announced when I speak as a pastor, and so when the Q&A comes, even though I have not talked about being a pastor, invariably someone says, how can you be a pastor when the Christian world has treated you the way it's treated you? And I have an answer to that question, as you would expect that I do. I don't know if any of you have read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind. It is an amazing book. His book after it, not so good in my opinion, The Coddling of the American Mind, but The Righteous Mind, I think is utterly brilliant. And in that book, he says, we as a species did not take off as long as we remained at the level of blood kin. He said, we did not take off when we remained at the level of blood kin. We took off as a species, developed civilizations, life took off when we moved from the level of blood kin to the level of tribe. So what brought us together as tribes? Ask most secular Americans, and they will say, safety. Man's a need for safety. Only that's wrong. What brought us together as a tribal species was, drum roll please, Man's search for meaning. Think Viktor Frankl. Not the need for safety, but man's search for meaning. That is what brought us together from the level of blood kin to the level of tribe. That's what caused us to explode forward as a species. It was man's search for meaning. I mean, you don't really have to look any more deeply than Stonehenge or the carved heads and bodies of Rapa Nui or the indigenous, or the burial mounds of indigenous Americans. It was, in fact, our search for meaning that brought us together. And here's the deal. As a species, we will always search for meaning in community. And being a part of community 
will always be more important to us than being right. And we'll say that again. Humans are more committed to belonging than to being right. So my doctorate is in pastoral counseling, and I'm a pastoral counselor, and that means my training is the same as any other psychotherapist, plus the spiritual stuff, which is kind of fun. So I have clients come to me with complex trauma in their backgrounds. They've been abused, often by their fathers in fundamentalist environments. And so they finally are healed enough that they're ready to confront the perpetrator. And all the time they say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to my family and my family knows every single thing that happened. So I know once I bring it out into the open, they will all get behind me. Yeah, no. And I have to be the one to tell them that 90% of the time they will not choose to back you up. They will know the truth and will sit there without an expression on their face. They will back up the perpetrator because we as a species tend to care more about belonging than we care about the truth. But it is, in fact, man's search for meaning that brings us together in tribes. And as tribes, we tend to have one of three moral standards. Just three, only three. Three moral standards. The first moral standard and the oldest moral standard is that there is no greater moral good the, to protect the integrity of the tribe. That's the oldest moral standard. Still the moral standard of many developing nations. Second moral standard, there is no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. That's the moral standard of all forms of fundamentalism wherever you find it, particularly the desert religions. The desert religions, the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, began in the desert. Therefore, understandably, they began as religions of scarcity. Not enough resources to go around, got to take care of me and mine. In their generous forms, they've evolved out of that, but in their fundamentalist forms, they remain religions of scarcity. So they are the gatekeepers determining who's in, who's out. You know, I'm, I, I'm up to to be doing the hosting for an NPR a podcast on Margaret Mead's work in American Samoa. And so I've been doing a lot of work recently studying uh, Tonga, Fiji, um, American Samoa, Samoa, the Maori people, Rapa Nui, uh, native uh, Hawaiians. And I'm discovering every one of those cultures had room for non-binary and trans people for eons. Why? Because they were not religions of scarcity. Their religions were religions of abundance because those religions developed in places of abundance. So there was assumption that there was room for everyone, but we in the West are primarily affected by the desert religions. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and those three in their fundamentalist forms continue to be religions of scarcity. So that's the second moral standard. First moral standard, no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the tribe. Second moral standard, no greater moral good than to obey the teachings of the gods. And then the third moral standard, there's no greater moral good than to protect the integrity of the individual. Now that is the moral standard of the secular West. That's the moral standard in all of Europe. I would dare say 99.99% .99 of the people here at Goose would say that is my moral standard, that there's no greater moral good than to protect the freedom of the individual. It is the moral standard of most of our educational institutions. It's the moral standard of the Pacific Northwest. It's the moral standard of the Northeastern United States. It is not the moral standard of the state in which we happen to be sitting right now. To a lesser degree, possibly. I mean, you know, it's turning a little more purple, but no. Right now, what is not understood by secular Americans is that Ours is, in fact, the smallest of the three moral standards worldwide and the youngest of the three. 
because you know who started the third moral standard? Back to why I still believe in religion. Um, it'd be Jesus, who on his last answer to the last public question he was ever asked, which of the laws was the greatest, said, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself, and then said what blew them away, on this are all the prophets and all the law and the prophets based. In other words, it's this, it's these three things. So coming together in community to search for meeting together under the guidance of the message of Jesus to love God, love neighbor, love self, I think that's every bit as relevant as it ever was, which is why I planted a church five years ago and why I still pastor a church, because I am convinced that that third moral standard that was established by Jesus is the hope for the future. And right now, that moral standard is in trouble. 556 anti-trans laws introduced, 78 signed into law. So you can take it personally if you happen to be trans, and oh my, do I get hate mail. In fact, if you look at my first TED Talk, it's had, I think, 7 million views. There are 16,000 comments. You know how many of those comments I have read? None, ever. Nor have I read a single review of my book. It, it just, you know, I mean, because haters hate, it's what they do. So you can't take it personally, but we do have to understand it. And so now, what I'm going to say next, this is the key stuff for you to understand. And those of you who were in here in the last session, it is exactly the stuff that they were talking about at the end of that session when it comes to the solution to our problem. Why are we the enemy? So Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson, how he was known, just passed away last year. E.O. Wilson taught at MIT and Harvard because one of those wasn't enough, apparently. And he won two Pulitzer Prizes. Not one, but two, because, you know, his first Pulitzer Prize was identifying the key social unit for our species. And he was the one who figured out the key social unit for our species was not the nuclear family, it was in fact the tribe, it was the small community. Changed the world of sociology forever with that discovery. The second of his Pulitzer Prizes, I think is even more relevant, certainly in this setting. He identified nine tribal species, just nine. Every species has what Richard Dawkins would call a selfish gene. These nine species also have a tribal gene. And what that means is they are willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of the tribe. An enemy comes into the camp. They unite. They defeat the enemy. Some of them die, but the tribe is safe. Life goes on. So eight of the nine species have evolved exactly as we would expect. They just get better at making sure they survive. The ninth species, unfortunately, has evolved in a way that he says, we don't get a hold of this. We lose a species and we lose the planet. He said the ninth eusocial species, that's what he calls them, eusocial, E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L. The ninth eusocial species has evolved to believe an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. And where no natural enemy exists, we create one. That is the issue. We've been doing it for eons, and right now, I am the enemy of choice. We don't get a hold of that. He says, we lose the species, we lose the planet. You don't have to read any of his books to get a real sense of this. Just go to Fresh Air and E.O. Wilson and just listen to that one two-hour show where he talks about this issue, that we are the only one of the tribal species that creates enemies that don't exist. So you take the work of E.O. Wilson, you put it together with the work of the anthropologist philosopher René Girard in his book, Violence and the Sacred, and what does he say in that book? He says that for eons, those in power, surprise, surprise, did not want to give up their power. And so they discovered the best way to keep their power was to identify enemies within the tribe. 
and to put themselves forward as the only one with the ability to identify those enemies and certainly the only one with the power to eradicate them. And so meta-narrative after meta-narrative after meta-narrative developed with leadership structures that created enemies that did not exist and had leaders who said, I'm the only one who can identify the enemy and I am the one who can rid you of the enemy. If any of that sounds familiar, then kind of let it be. It's also interesting, this is just a bit of an aside. You know, Rene Girard said, of all the meta-narratives out there, there's only one that's not a power meta-narrative. Only one that is a meta-narrative of not the victor, but the victim. Of not the oppressor, but the oppressed. He says, if in fact our species would actually live by that one meta-narrative, there's hope for the species. And what is the meta-narrative? It's the meta-narrative of Jesus. The one who says, love God, love neighbor, love self. I don't think he was a Christian. And he certainly was not endorsing the religion of Christianity. But he was saying there is a meta-narrative that can get us out of this mess. To love God, love neighbor, love self. Another reason I still believe in the church. So the creation of enemies that don't exist, we should not be surprised that these are always virtually powerless people groups. So right now, it's 0.58% of the population, people who are transgender. We are the enemy. And I mean, let's be honest, look at me. Don't I really just look like an enemy? Actually, that's a part of the solution. We'll come to that in just a couple of minutes. That's what we're up against today. It's the creation of an enemy that does not exist. So think about it. Every time there's a major cultural paradigm shift, the same process takes place. Starts with the philosophers, goes from the philosophers to the artists, from the artists to the world of science, the ac academy, from the academy to culture at large, from culture at large to religion. Religion is always the very last bringing up the rear when there's a major paradigm shift. We are, in fact, in the midst of a major paradigm shift. From postmodern or from modern age to something that comes after that at this point we don't really know what it is, so we just call it not modern age. We call it postmodern. And you can see the postmodern shift taking place. Late modern age philosophers would be the existentialists, Jacques Maritain and, and Albert Camus or, or Wittgenstein, logical positivism. And then you go to the early postmodern philosophers, Foucault, Derrida, Richard Rorty. And you move to the realm of the arts. Late modern age classical music, Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky, Prokofiev. Early postmodern classical music, John Cage, some people would say Philip Glass. I'm not so sure about that. Then you go to the academy. Late scientific modern age, quantum mechanics, quantum physics. The discovery that, the, key so, that the, the building blocks of the universe are not made of matter, but are made of a pattern of relationships between non-material entities. That's modern age. Early postmodern scientific stuff? Yeah, that's AI. And we are just now getting there, and that is philosophically, scientifically, going to shift the narrative massively. So then it goes to popular culture. Now, if you want to look at popular culture, look at Broadway. Late modern age, Les Miserables. Traditional Broadway show based on a French novel of a couple of hundred years before. End of modern age. Now we go to the bridge between modern age and postmodern age, 25 years ago, Rent. That is a bit of a postmodern show, a bit of a modern age show, and then you go to pure postmodern Broadway show, and it is not enough New Yorkers here. It is Hamilton. I mean, it is absolutely, that's uh, utterly different than anything we've ever experienced before. So then you come to religion. And what you have are the 
fundamentalist forms of the desert religions hanging on for dear life, trying to control the narrative as long as they can, and you have on the other side a much more open understanding of a God who loves because it's who he, who he, she, they are, what God is. And we're in the middle of that. And so that's the genesis of a lot of what is thrown at us. What can we do about it? It's simple. It's not easy. I really think there are only two ways to handle this. Proximity and narrative. I mean, I think that's it. I think that's our only hope, frankly. Proximity and narrative. Think about it. You don't sleep without dreaming. None of us do. None of us sleeps without dreaming. And how do you dream? You don't dream in mathematical equations. You, you do not do that. I have had a couple people tell me they did. Okay. We don't dream in mathematical equations. We dream in stories. Our need for story is downright biological. So we did a thing here on Wednesday night where we had three speakers. I spoke on trans issues. Someone spoke on climate change. Uh, someone spoke on psilocybin and psychedelics. And we had presenters from this week coming around three campfires, hearing three stories three times, and then brainstorming how we can change the narrative. So I got that idea, doing that for Hollywood writers last November, 60 of them. 60 Hollywood writers who are currently writing currently scripted shows. And no, not a one of them would tell me how things are going to turn out in my favorite shows for this year, which especially the people from Ted Lasso, but that's okay. Or the L word, that, but it's okay. Um, so all of these are current writers, and so they brought together four speakers to speak on four issues. I was speaking there on what my TED Talks are about, which is gender equity, not trans stuff. And then we had a, a young gentleman who's a DACA recipient who was an actor in uh, Black Panther. And we had the Theranos whistleblower speaking on behalf of whistleblowers. And um, then we had a psychiatrist from New York City who's an expert in psilocybin and particularly ayahuasca. And having the conversations with writers, why would we choose television writers? It took us 150 years to make slavery illegal. It took us 20, 20 to get to marriage equality. Why? It starts with all in the family goes from All in the Family to the scripted Ellen show, not her talk show, her scripted show, from there to Will and Grace, and from there to Modern Family. There's a sequence, and the sequence ends in two people who just happen to be gay. It becomes the norm. Now, you know, you can imagine what I talked with the folks about when trans stuff came up in the Q&A. They said, how should we be presenting trans stuff? I said, it's incidental. That's how you should be treating it. You know, my, my favorite thing that happened this year is I, I ran for public office, was elected in Boulder County, Colorado. And so the mayor and the um, administrator of our town were saying at a meeting eh, three weeks ago, they said, we've gotten a lot of shit done, uh, particularly in the realm of wildfire mitigation, which for us, it's a bit of an issue, uh, and affordable housing, which is another issue. We were one of the first municipalities in Colorado to approve tiny homes for 100, or 360 days a year uh, living. And then we also are focusing on, on gun control. So our mayor and our uh, town supervisor, ad administrator, we're saying to all of us on the board, oh, everybody, you guys all, all got to re-up because this has been a great board. We're going to get a lot done. And I said, um, yeah, a lot has shifted since the last election. And as a trans woman, there's no guarantee that I'm going to get elected next time around. At which point, all of them, all of them said, I loved it. This is what you dream for. All of them said, oh, my God, that's right. We always forget you're trans. That, that, that is where we need to be headed. 
that's the spot so that it becomes common. So that's why we talked to television writers, because we know the power of television. And that's why I'm talking to you, because you are the influencers. And we're only going to get this done by telling stories in close proximity. So I am a coach for TED. I, I am what they call a speaker's ambassador for TED speakers from all over the world. I uh, will be one of two working TED women in Atlanta this October. I am also a curator and the head coach for the largest TEDx in North America. It has never come up in any of those environments that I happen to be transgender. Never come up. So it was kind of fun when we did an event just three weeks ago where one of the speakers was the district attorney of the most conservative county in the state of Colorado. And guess who he was assigned to work with as a speaker's coach? <laughs> so my job was to turn him from a closing argument district attorney to a TED speaker, which is not an easy thing to do. When he first found out I was going to be the the person. He was fine with that. And then he found out I was trans and he was not particularly fine with it. And then by the time he gave his talk, which was amazing, his talk was on vicarious trauma. It was amazing. Two people had been changed. He'd been changed. And damn it, so had I. He's a delightful human being. Wonderful dad, good husband, just on the wrong side politically. Proximity and narrative. If we can get in the same room and talk to each other. So I, I worked with a speaker last year at um, TED, Manish Bardwaj, who teaches at MIT and at Princeton. At Princeton, he teaches a course, I said this the other night, he teaches a course Moral Clarity for Entrepreneurs, which is an oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Uh, an elective, 70% of those who take the class are women. So I gotta be honest, I do believe that it in fact is likely to be those who identify as female who are going to lead the charge on all this. Just like it was six nations with a female head of state that led the charge on vaccinations with COVID. It is telling stories in close proximity. So he taught a course this past semester at MIT on proximity and narrative that's based on the work that we've done together. Getting people in a room, telling their stories. StoryCorps is doing the same thing. And I just worked recently with um, Spirit Arrow, which builds a fuselage for the 737 MAX and the 787. And they are heavily involved, largest employer in Wichita. They are heavily involved in this process. It has been life-changing for the company because what they're doing is bringing people together from completely different backgrounds just to eat a meal. That's it. It is proximity and narrative, I'm convinced, that changes the narrative. I get paid a hell of a lot of money to speak at universities around the world. I go to Christian universities pro bono. I pay my own way. Because if I can get in front of those kids, I love, I love what happens to them. They're like, oh, God, she appears to be relatively normal. You know, as normal as my parents are, who, of course, are not normal. But she seems like them. Yes. Success. That, I believe, is a direction we've got to go. So what can you do? Bring in people who are non-binary and trans, not because they're non-binary and trans, bring them in because they're good at whatever it is they're good at. And ask them to do it. And never mention that they're trans. You know, I, it never comes up as a TED coach. I just happen to know how to help people memorize 15-minute talks and present them in a way that doesn't bore everybody to hell. That, I believe, is what we need you, our allies, to do. And we need you to do it at our direction. And particularly now I'm talking to the white guys. 
White guys think our job is done when we're allies. When you're an ally, you're still in charge of everything. You're still the one saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this for your community. Yeah, no. We need you to move from allies to apprentices. We need you to listen to the minorities, to the oppressed, and work at their direction. You're in positions of power. That's a good thing. Let us help you determine what you do with that power. That's also a good thing. That's why I sign with a Hollywood company where I have control over the narrative of the 30 shows because I want to make sure that it's not somebody, some powerful white guy, just saying this is what I think we should do for you, but no, that it is where my, the fact that I'm trans is actually incidental to what I do. So I want to take about just 10 minutes and answer questions that you might have. And because we only have 11 more minutes, I'm going to ask you to hold them to questions, uh, not comments. And um, I will repeat the questions so that you can hear what they are. But anybody have any questions uh, that you want, to, you want to ask related to what we've been talking about? Does it do any good to contact legislators? You're damn right. And now that I am, in fact, an elected official, I pay serious attention to the mail I get. I mean, even if it's, I don't like the sidewalk at 317 Evans, which an inordinate number of people don't like the sidewalk at 317 Evans. <laughs> Way too many people with a lot of time on their hands. Um, but I pay attention to every last piece of it. And everybody else I talk to says, yeah, we, we do the same. Yeah, I, think, I don't think we ever back off from that. I don't think we back off from that. I think we talk over and over and over. I mean, it's, I, I don't think we can back down at the political level. The one-on-one -on -one is where it's going to be solved. But at the political level, we've got to fight back. I mean, the way it's going, I will not be able to get estrogen in several states within 36 months. That's not a good thing. Now, I will say one thing. I will tiptoe into this. A lot of the opposition that is coming is because of medical treatment of adolescents. And here's the thing. Don't look to the United States to answer that question. It's too politically a hot topic. Go to Europe. See what's happening in Europe. Nobody gives a shit in Europe about this issue. The Dutch protocol has been used for trans folks since the 1970s. It's 50 years in. Significantly, over time, 0.58% of the population identifies as transgender specifically, as the gender in a two-gender system, not on their birth certificate. So what they're seeing in Europe, Belgium is seeing a 42-fold increase in those who identify as trans. Switzerland is seeing a 17-fold increase, not percent, fold increase in those who are identifying as trans. Sweden is seeing a 75% increase in those who identify as trans who also have a serious comorbidity or a diagnosis of significant mental disability. And 75% of that group were identified as female at birth. So in Holland, they used to treat about 60 adolescents a year medically who were transgender. Last year, it was 1,600. And there's a lot of interest in this because there's likely two things going on. One is a lot of trans people are finally free to express who they are. This is wonderful. This is great. This is good. But there are also a lot of other young people who are doing what young people have been doing forever. If you're a family systems person, it's, it's differentiation. If you're a Jungian, it's individuation. Whatever it is, it's figuring out who you are. And I love the fact that they can do that with their gender. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Should they be treated medically? It is a legitimate question. 
I just baptized a person Sunday night who's been at our church for two years, identifying as male, was baptized as female, and has decided after two years that they do, in fact, want to identify as a female. And our church is such that we moved from Victor to Visenya, which was the birth name. I mean, fine, fine, happens all the time. Doesn't have to be a big issue. The issue is medical treatment. So here, as a therapist, is my perspective. If you're dealing with someone who had early onset gender dysphoria, what the DSM-5 calls it, early onset meaning early in life, they consistently and persistently said they were not the gender on their birth certificate, that child will always be transgender. Nothing's going to shift, nothing's going to change. They're going to go through their teen, adolescent years, they're still going to be transgender. That child can be treated medically early. But what about those who come out as transgender at 13, 14, 15? I love it. It's marvelous. And wait till next Thursday. Because Claire became River, became Sage, became Mason, became Claire. Also in my church. And every, you know, mom and dad were initially really nervous about it. What do we do? What do we do? I said, just say, okay, river? Okay, it's river. Just go with each of them. Sage, that's kind of cool. I like that name, Sage. Mason, I don't know where that came from. Makes me think of a jar, but it's okay. <laughs> and then now back at Claire. So should that person be receiving medical treatment only if it is reversible? That's my opinion, and that will get me in trouble with a lot of folks who do, in fact, believe in informed consent. I actually agree with the WPATH uh, documents on who should be treated, the World a Professional Association for Transgender Health. I think we need to be careful about who receives medical treatment. Particularly, testosterone is a very powerful substance that makes changes that will not be reversed. And so I think we do need to be careful in that area. Other questions? How far away are we? Uh, I think we have to look at, at uh, LGB to see that. And I used to work with a lot of megachurch lead pastors. My, my doctoral um, project was on identifying and hiring entrepreneurial types as lead pastors. Um, The time I transitioned, which is 10 years ago, already over 50% of them had moved, had already moved on marriage equality, and virtually all of them said, and you would know a lot of these names, all of them said, I've moved on on this. My money hasn't. So, you know, I've, I am talking to a major corporation right now about speaking for them that is a very conservative corporation. But the next generation down doesn't believe what mom and dad believed and definitely don't believe what grandpa believed. And so we're seeing a shift in that. And I believe if we're smarter than Anheuser-Busch, we'll be okay. <laughs> I mean, Anheuser-Busch does, I said this Wednesday night too, does no one at Anheuser-Busch understand that no one on the left drinks Bud Light? <laughs> Do they not know this? That is not rocket science, folks. <laughs> and not a wise move considering your market. I mean, it was bold, but yet not considering your market. So we'll see the church shift. I mean, 51% of evangelicals are supportive of marriage equality. Uh, of evangelical millennials are supportive of marriage equality, while the boomers are still at 37 or 34%. So already a majority of evangelical millennials and Gen Z are supportive of marriage equality. So it's going to happen. I thought it was going to happen in about five years because, hey, here's the thing. The Bible doesn't say anything on trans issues except for Jesus kind of welcoming those who were non-binary. And somehow they found scriptures that miraculously are anti-trans. That's why there's no reason. I, it, 
don't get into a debate, it ain't worth it. I mean, we're working from different hermeneutics, let alone exegesis. It is a whole different hermeneutic. Um, who knew that they would find these? Of course, it has nothing to do with scripture. It only has to do with fear of a cultural shift taking place that they don't like. Ultimately, my own opinion is it has to do with white racism. Uh, and it's just, it's just a side of that that's not nearly as long-lasting or as long-term damaging as racism has been. Um, I got, w I can take one more question. I got one minute. It'll be a real short answer. As an ally who's a leader at a corporation, uh, what does it take to move to apprenticeship? Talk to me afterwards. I specialize in this area. <laughs> I work with a lot of major corporations specifically on that. In fact, in my uh, counseling practice, I actually focus on C-suite uh, people, most of them white guys. Um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of ideas about that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.